<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. How are you? Hello. Okay, so uh, hello everyone once again. Uh, thank you very much for joining. So we will just start now. Uh, I have uh, received a few queries over the email and there are some queries in the chat as well. And uh, these queries are related to LaTeX and uh, some queries are related to homework and other things. So I decided to answer them here. Uh, first of all, um, there was some confusion about the Sakai LMS site. So when I received the Sakai site, it was only it was only for one one section of the course. So initially there were two sections, but only one section was provided to me, and that's why we we had class uh, for only one section. And then from next class, I was informed that there is a and there is another section. Some students from another section were also joined, um, but still the Sakai was just for one section. Uh, one of the students informed me and, and uh, said that they cannot uh, access the lecture notes and other things. Uh, they cannot access the lecture notes or, or, or other things. So I have to, uh, I mean, so I said, okay, I will, I will look into it. And I immediately sent an email to IT and, and the program office. And, and uh, so there was, there was a site, but it was either was not, uh, I mean, I, I did not have access to it. So now this site is available to me and it's not just available, it's been merged and combined with, uh, with the original site. So everything that I have uploaded so far is accessible to every student in this class. And everything that I will upload now will be available to every student in the class. So from this point onwards, uh, everything will be fine. Uh, second thing, there was a question about uh, the homework, the problem set that there are some questions which 
we haven't yet studied. Uh, yes, that's true. We haven't yet studied. And I included those questions that probably we would study uh, in, in today's class. So if we study doing today's class, that's perfectly fine. Then you can be able to solve them. And if we still don't study them, then we will extend the deadline for the submission of the first problem set. So, so that's that's okay. So I will I will update uh, the date deadline uh, for the problem set, and I will announce it uh, on, on LMS that what is the situation. Uh, there is there are some queries about LaTeX, and uh, and some students ask me that maybe we can uh, they they could use Word or uh, write it by hand or some other way and rather than uh, creating a latex file uh, that's okay but i would not prefer it uh, so i would require i would ask that all of you use latex so um you, you can you can use latex and latex is available for free on almost all platform that you uh, might be using so it's available for windows for mac for linux and it is also available for for web so if you do not want to install, install it, or you do not have enough space, or you do not have uh, enough resources, uh, then you can uh, use it over the web, which is called Overly. So if you use Overly, it's a web-based uh, solution. So you can write your document as a Google Doc. It's a kind of it's a kind of Google Doc. So you need to create an account at the overleaf. It's just free. Just create an account. Um, then you write, create your document. Uh, once you create the document, it, it will allow you to uh, write it in LaTeX. There is a LaTeX editor over there. And if there is any error in your document, it will notify you. Then you can compile. And once everything is fine, you can download the PDF file and so on. So this is one way of doing it, right? So you can use um, overleaf. It's a web-based solution to create uh, LaTeX documents. Uh, or if you want to install LaTeX, you can download the LaTeX on your machine uh, and, and, and use it, right? If I'm you download, uh, yes. Uh, do we have to submit the text file or the PDF? Actually, I prefer a text file. Uh, but the thing is that when you submit text file, then I find it's, it's like, should we submit an executable file or the source code? I very much prefer source code rather than an executable file. Um, but the problem with source code, source code is that there might be some errors in the document. And uh, if your document does not compile at my site, uh, then I would not be able to grade it, right? So, so, uh, so I, I can give you this uh, this freedom and set and, and ask you to submit the PDF file. Um, so you sorry, don't have okay to submit the source code. Is it okay if we uh, submit a zip file containing both tech and PDF? It is possible. And if you want to do that, please do that. Uh, you can either submit a PDF file or submit um, a PDF file with source code. So you can combine all of them in a zip file and, and submit it. Okay, sir. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that, that's it. So if you are using uh, Windows, then it's called make that that you can download. If you are using Linux, then it is called tech live. You need to install this package. And if you are using Mac, then it is called Mac tech. Right? So you can download these packages. If you want to download the whole thing, you can download the whole thing. Uh, it is all now also available as a, I mean, small subset of packages. So you can install that one uh, depending on your requirement. Uh, so this is the system and you need to install and uh, I mean, set up it, set it up. And um, for the editor, there are so many editor or on uh, for LaTeX. Um, so you can use VS Code. You can use Sublime. You can use Vim. Uh, you can use Emacs. Okay. So, or if you want to use some, uh, I mean, specific editor, you can also use that. And uh, there is there is an editor called uh, Tech Studio. There is an editor called TechWorks. 
and there are so many other editors. So you just search and you will find. So most of these editors are cross platform. So if one of them is available for one of the platform, then it is also available for the other platform as well. So they are all available for Mac and Windows and, and Linux. So it, it, it should be okay. But if you go for the overleaf, then you don't have to install anything. Uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, if you needed any help at how to use LaTeX, uh, then I would recommend this. Um, there is a document which you can download. It's a very small PDF. Uh, it's called the not so short introduction to LaTeX. So it, it's a very good document. You can download it and uh, read it. It's, it's, it's good. <clears throat> Is everything clear? Any questions? Sir, if we have installed LinkedIn, do we need to be a phone from line? I cannot hear you. Uh, your voice is um, breaking and it's too low. Can you repeat? Sir, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Uh, sir, if we, are, if we have installed MicTex, do we need VS Code sometime when, et cetera? Yes. It's like uh, installing GCC as a compiler and the editor to write the code. So, uh, is there any editor that you prefer, or should we download anyone? Any Anyone of it. It's it's your uh, personal preference. If you are if you are familiar with VS Code, then you can use VS Code. Uh, if you are familiar with Vim or Emacs, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you are new to it and you haven't used any other editor before, then uh, you can use Tech Studio, TechWorks. They are pre-built, and you don't have to do anything. Okay, sir. Any other question related to LaTeX? Okay, so we can start our lecture. And uh, we started talking about um, strings and alphabet and um, languages. So, so let me repeat a few things from last time. I will just repeat very quickly. Uh, we all know what is an alphabet. If there is any question, please let me know. We all know what is a string. Now we all know what is a language. Right. So I, I hope that everyone is familiar and comfortable with the concept of alphabet and the concept of string. And the concept of language, right? So, for example, so this is an, just an example. So, suppose this is sigma, which is an alphabet. AB is an example alphabet. So, some strings over AB or some strings over this alphabet could be uh, an empty string, AB, AAB, AB, and so on. These are some strings. And what is a language? A language. It's a subset, the language is a set of strings. So suppose I say I have a set of strings, which are A, B, A, A, B, B, A, 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 B, 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 A, 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 B, 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 so on. So this is a set of strings such that it has same number of A's and same number of B's such that N is greater than or equal to one. And, and belongs to such. Right? So this is one language. So this is an example of an alphabet. This is an example of a string, another string, another string. Uh, this is a language. And this language, we define this language formally over here that it contains all the strings of the form A, N, B, N. That means that the same number of A's, so all the A's in this string are before all the Bs, and the number of A's is exactly equal to the number of Bs. And the num many, smallest number, number of uh, characters is, is one A in one B. Okay, so this is one uh, possible thing. So this is just a recap. Any, anything, any question from there? 
Okay. Now, with this, we define our first um, automata, not just first, we define two different automata. And the first one was that we have a Q1 state Q1. Uh, we read one, go to state Q2. This Q2 is the final state. And if we, are, if we read zero, we stay in Q1. If we read one, we stay in Q1. And from Q2, we read uh, zero, we go to Q3. And from Q3, we come back to Q2, if either we read zero or one, right? And then we found out what is the mechanism of this, this automata or what this automata do. Um, and um, so we can see that what happens if we send one, one, zero, one uh, to, this, to this machine, then starting from here, it reads one. So one takes to Q1, uh, Q2, then the second one will keep it in Q2, then zero will take it to Q3, then the one will come uh, take it back to Q2. Q2. So once the machine ends reading the input, the state, the, the state of the machine is in state Q2, which is an acceptable state. Therefore, this string is accepted. Now, on the other hand, let's say that we send 0, 1, 1, 0. So if this is the string that we send to this machine, we can see that we start reading from this point. So this first zero will keep the string, will keep the machine in the first state, that is Q1. The second one will take it to Q2. Third one will, so the third character, which is equal to one, will keep the machine in Q2. And the last element, which is zero, will take it to Q3. Q3. So when the string ends, the machine is in Q3 and Q3 is not an accepting state. Therefore, this string is not accepted. And we can try many different uh, strings and see that uh, what is what are the strings which are accepted, what are the strings which are not accepted. So, so this was an example where we created an automaton and we saw that what are the strings which are accepted or not accepted, right? And then we uh, did one more example where we had a problem, we had a computation question, and for that computation uh, question, we created a machine and. Uh, and we saw that that machine actually answered uh, the question correctly because whenever the input was even, it answered yes, or it ended in a state which is acceptable state. And whenever this input was not even, it ended in a state which was not acceptable, right? So do you remember that machine? So let's say the state is T1, uh, we start in T1, and if we read zero, we stay here and this starting state is also the final state or the accepting state. If at this point we read one, it goes to P2. And at P2, if it reads one, it keeps here. And if it reads zero, it comes back. So this machine, this machine answers the question whether the input is even or not. So you can say that we can embed this machine into a box, a black box, and call this black box machine M and suppose this is the input X, then this machine will output yes, and this will, machine will output no. So whenever this string ends in this state, that is the acceptable state, we say that it answers yes. And whenever this string ends, so this machine ends in a state which is not acceptable, it answers no. Is this thing clear? Um, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, like this uh, automaton has a purpose, right? It's giving you, uh, uh, it's accepting a certain type of string, if it, whether it's even or it's odd. The previous yes. one, did it also have a purpose? Yes. So what kind of strings was it uh, Was it accepting? Like was, it, it was, was there like some specific kind of strings? Oh, yes, it, it was for a specific kind of a string and we will come back and see that what is the language uh, that it accepts. Okay. So we will connect the, co the question of computational model, uh, there is a model that answers some computational uh, question directly with the question of languages. And so we will connect these two concepts and we will see that uh, what language this machine, this machine M, which we just created here, which is on the screen, uh, accepts and which language the previous machine accepts. 
And, and, and that specific language basically tells us the actual answer to the computational uh, underlying computational problem that we are trying to address. Okay. So we will come back to that. And even if you don't come back, you will figure, we will figure it out for some other machines and it will be easy with what is happening. Okay. Yes, any other question? There are many, many computation problems for which we cannot uh, have a finite operator. So there are so many computation problems for which we cannot construct any finite operator. Why? The answer is very simple because this is the uh, this is the simplest form, or simplest model of computation. Right? So it can only solve some uh, problems. And if you remember when I started describing finite automaton, I said that uh, this automaton has extremely limited memory. So all those problems which require uh, extensive amount of memory cannot be solved using this finite automaton, right? And and in fact, I've already given you an example where we, for which we cannot construct, uh, for which we cannot construct any machine, any finer automata with answers. And that is for this language. For this language, we cannot, we cannot uh, construct a finite automata which accepts strings from this language. And we will see that why it is impossible. Uh, but we will not see it today, we will see it toward the maybe uh, next week. Uh, when we will do uh, one important thing, which called which we call a pumping lemma. So, so, uh, so we, we will see. Okay. So, if no question, then uh, I will uh, proceed with some formal definition. And we say that. So, let me write the formal definition of finite law. <clears throat> so, we say that a finite automaton. Is a five triple. So what what is meant by five triple? It's a it's a combination or collection of five things. What are those five things? Uh, the first thing is Q. The second thing is sigma. Third thing is delta. Fourth thing is Q zero, and the fifth thing is F. Where so I would write what what are these things? So where Q is this is a finite. Set of states, right? So, for example, in this this example, we have two states, p1, p2. In the previous example, we had three states, q1, q2, q3. So, so all the states in your machine are from a set q, right? So, this is a set of states. So, the only requirement for this set is that it has to be finite. So, we can have one state, or we can have zero states, or one state, or two states, or five states. We cannot have infinite set states, and that's why this finite automaton gets its name from. So it has it has to have finite states. Okay. The second thing is sigma, uh, which we all we all know what is that, and this is is a finite uh, set called alphabet. Right. So we are all familiar. What is an alphabet? This is the finite set. Alphabet. What is delta? Uh, delta is a function. It's a transition function, right? So it's a transition function. Transition function tells us uh, that what happens when the machine is in one state and reads some symbol, then where it should go, right? So it has to know what is the current state, okay? And what is the current symbol that it is reading? And based on it, it tells you what where to go. So this is the definition of uh, transition function, right? This is how we define it. Q0 is the initial state. Whenever we have a finite automaton, uh, we need to know what state is the starting state or the initial state, right? The start, initial state or starting state. While F is a subset of Q, that is the, um, that is a, that is all the states in, in the automata, so in, in, in our automaton, we would designate some states as the accept states or final states. Final states or accept states. This is just a formal definition of finite automaton. You don't have to remember it. it it's, 
So once you start using Finite Automate, then you will uh, get used to it, right? So Finite Automate is five things. The first thing you need to know about Finite Automate is the number of, uh, is the states, all states in, in the Automate, the sigma, which is the alphabet on which this machine works, in the transition function, which is the most important thing in, in Automate. And you also need to know where which state you need to start with and what are the states which are the final or acceptance states. Okay. So for this machine, which we have here, uh, so let me redraw this machine over here. So we have uh, P1, then we have uh, P2. In P1, if we read zero, stays here, one stays here, one here, and zero. So in this machine, we have five things, which is Q, Sigma, Delta, Q0, Q0 and F. So Q over here is two states, P1 and P2. Okay. Sigma is zero and one. Transition function over here, it says that if the machine is in P1 and it leaves zero, it stays in P1. The machine is in P1 and leads one, it goes to P2. The machine is in P2, leads one, it stays in P2. And if the machine is in P2 and leads zero, it goes back to P1. So this is our transition. So you can write the transition function as a table or as these uh, things, or you can come up with some other definition. Uh, what is Q0? Q0 is the starting state or the initial state. So in this one, we have P1, which is the initial state. So you don't have to write Q1. You can just simply say it is P1. Okay, so P1 is our starting state. Okay, and what is our F? So let's just start. And what is our F? F is the subset of Q. So F contains P1. So F is the P1. So this is now the formal definition or complete description of our automate in here, right? So you can use a similar definition uh, for the for the other one that we defined previously. Sir? Yes. Sir, what is that Q2? Q2, there is no Q2. There is a Q2. I think there should be P2. Uh, Oh, yes. in set of Q. Thank you. Sorry for that. A typo. Sir? Okay. Yes. So it can F be P2 also? Uh, in this particular case, no, because this is how we define it. So whatever you define can be the final state. So we said uh, F is subset of Q, right? Yes. Then F, if F can be uh, P2? Of course, but then it will not be the same machine which we are defining. In this machine, P1 has to be the accepting state because we want the strings to be accepted whenever they are even. If P2 is the accepting state, then it will start accepting odd strings, not even strings. And if you make, if you make both of them uh, final state, then it will accept all the strings, regardless whether even or or odd. So it will not uh, solve any computation. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, any other question? Okay, so so I, I now I would like to uh, I mean introduce one maybe the the most important. Um, uh, aspect of, of this course so far. So, so whatever we have learned so far, uh, so this is one of the most important. Things. So we say that if A is the set of all strings that the machine M except okay. we say we say that A is 
the language of X. Okay, so we say that the that A is the language of the machine, M. So in this case, we write L of M, M is the machine. So we say L of M, M means that the language of machine is A. And say M accepts A or M recognizes Okay, is this in clear? <clears throat> so if you come back yes. here and we say that this is a machine M, let's call it M2, then what is the language of M2? So let's say A is the, all, all the strings which are accepted, then we know that what are these, these uh, what are these strings? We say that A consists of all the strings all bit strings, right? Because we are talking about zero one alphabet. All bit strings such that they represent an even string, even number, right? Okay, is this in clear? Okay, so L of M2 is equal to A. So now, so, so we start M2, M2 is this machine, which we call this, this machine. Oh, okay. okay. So we started with the concept of uh, alphabet and strings, and then we extended this concept to uh, languages. We say that uh, whenever we have few strings, so whenever we have some strings, the set of any strings is basically a language and uh, languages can come in many different flavors and sizes and styles. Uh, and sometimes we are interested in all languages, but most of the time we are interested only in languages uh, which have some pattern, some style, some something inherent to it, okay? And then we stopped uh, our discussion over there and we started talking about uh, constructing a computational model. So once we can start constructed a computational model, First, I gave you an example of a simple uh, automaton which did something and, and we pass some strings, it accepts, we pass some string, it does not accept. And then we say, okay, let's talk about solving computational problems. So we started with a question of a very simple computational uh, question, which is uh, whether if, if a string, which is represented in, in binary, uh, which represent basically a non-negative natural number, uh, which represents the natural number. So, so the question was, so the underlying number represented by the bit string, is this number an even number or not, right? So this is a valid computational question that you can solve using any modern programming language. And um, you can write a function in Pascal or Java or Python or any other programming language. And we said that, okay, let's try to solve this problem using finite automaton. And we constructed an automaton which exactly solves that problem, right? And once we solved the computation problem, I said, okay, let's stop here. And whatever that we learned about strings and whatever that we have learned about the automaton, let's combine them. So this is where we combine them. This is, this is where we merge these two concepts. So we say that whenever we have a language, okay, so there must be some machine which, which, which accepts or recognizes that language. And whenever we have uh, some machine, then there must be some underlying language for that machine, right? So right now we are only talking about finite automaton. So we are limited by many different computational uh, things. Well, so finite automaton are limited computational models. Uh, they cannot do everything. They can only do few things. And with this limited model of computation, we can solve some computation problems. And once we solve those computation problems, uh, we say that, okay, if I have a computational problem and suppose I can have I find an automaton that solves this problem. Uh, so once we solve it, let's find that whatever that we have solved, how it is represented in terms of language. So this is the definition 
uh, which connects the definition of languages with the definition of uh, computational machines. Is this thing clear? Yes. Any, any question? No question? Okay, so let's move on. Um, sir? Yes. So you said that uh, for every language, there must exist a machine that accepts that language, right? But you also said that there is some language where, where no machine can exist for it. There's no uh, ENE. Yes. yes, so when I said, I, I, I feared that somebody will ask this question. Uh, so both of my statements are correct. They're not in contradiction because I said that for every language there's a machine. Uh, but not for every language, there's a finite automaton. So there are, the machines are not only the finite automaton. There are other different kinds of machines which we will study in this course. And finite automaton are just one type of machine. Okay. So we will uh, learn more complicated, more complex machines later on. And we will see that there are certain languages which cannot be accepted or recognized by some uh, finite automaton. But then we have more complicated and um, uh, powerful machines which can accept them. And then, so, so the, the, the thing is that, uh, this is exactly the next topic that we will talk about. Uh, so we start with a very simple form of languages, okay? So this is a very small set of languages for which we can, uh, so, so, so forget about this one. So, so we say that, so we have finite automaton. So finite automaton can accept or recognize a set of languages, right? So these all languages, can be accepted by or recognized by finite automaton. But then there are languages which cannot be accepted or recognized by finite automaton. So in that case, we just need to extend our definition of finite automaton uh, as, and, and create a more complicated or more powerful computation model. And then these languages will be accepted or recognized by that different machines, okay? Uh, so I, I'm not going to give a name right now uh, because I don't want to complicate things. Uh, but even then, we will see that there are certain languages which cannot be accepted by this uh, more complex. So I would call it level one, and I would call it level two, level two machines. This is not the right name. I'm just uh, giving this name here uh, to make, to, to understand, but it, these are not the right names. Uh, so we have a more complicated machine, more powerful machine, which will recognize all these languages and these languages as well. Uh, but then there will we will find some languages which are outside uh, the scope or the capabilities of level two machines. And then we will see that, okay, we can still recognize some of them using an even more powerful machine, level three machines and so on. So there's this, there's this whole hierarchy of uh, types or categories of languages. And there's those, this whole hierarchy of uh, categories of more powerful machines. And ultimately we will reach to a level which we call uh, Turing machines. And Turing machines are the machines uh, which can recognize any language that we can think of. Okay, so, but then we will see that there's limitation of Turing machine and there are certain languages which cannot be recognized or accepted by Turing machines themselves. And we will say, okay, this is something that we cannot do anything. And these languages are beyond our capacity to comprehend and understand and think about. So if we cannot solve it, nobody can solve it, right? So for those languages, we know how they, they might look, uh, but we have no way to construct any machine which recognizes itself, okay? Anyway, so uh, I would reiterate over here that the number of languages which a finite automaton can recognize is infinite. It's infinitely large. But there are more languages that this finite automata cannot accept than the, the number of languages it can accept, okay? Then the number of languages, all languages which can be accepted by level two machines is also infinite. But all the languages which level, even level two machine cannot accept is more than all these languages, right? So similarly, Turing machines can accept infinitely many different languages, uh, but still there are languages which Turing machines cannot accept. And we know only few of them for sure. Anyway, 
so 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 the most important thing here is that we know what is the concept of finite automata and we we know what is a language and what is the connection of language right so whenever we have a machine m uh, we have l of m which is the language of the machine okay so if there is no question then we can proceed no questions okay so the simplest form since finite automaton is the simplest form of um, any computational model it's the basic computational model uh, and it recognizes or accepts some languages uh, then we introduce the most basic kind of languages. So the most basic languages are called regular languages. Okay, so these are very basic languages, but don't uh, get intimidated by the, by the name. Uh, regular languages are, even though they are very simple and, and basic, but still they can do a lot of things, right? So what is the definition of a regular language? <clears throat> The definition is very simple and the definition is connected with the definition of finite automata. We say that a language, a language is called regular language okay, if some finite Automaton recognizes. Definition is very simple. So if I give you some description of a language and you're able to come up with a finite automaton, then that language must be regular language. Okay. And later on, we will see there is another definition, which is the opposite or the reverse of it, which will apply, but but we, we will uh, handle that definition when we will uh, get to that point. Is this thing clear? So a regular language is called, a language is called regular language if some finite automaton recognizes it or accepts it, right? So when you say that some finite automaton recognizes it, it doesn't mean that it is uh, your ability to recognize or construct a machine which recognizes the finite automaton, right? Uh, recognize the language. So if it is possible to do that, then that language would be called uh, regular, even though if you are not able to, for example, if in, in, in question, uh, suppose in exam, there was a question and I say that construct a finite automaton for this language. And you say that, uh, and, and I ask, is this language regular? And you try to construct the finite automaton. And for some reason you cannot construct the finite automaton. Uh, then somebody may say that, oh, it's not, it's not regular because I was not able to construct uh, a finite automaton. No, that's not how it works, right? So it's not that you could not construct. If nobody could construct a finite automaton, then of course it's not regular. But if anyone can construct a finite automaton, then it is regular, right? So and is there, is, is there any criteria for finding out if any language has a finite automaton or not? Yes, that that was exactly my point. So it's it's not just left. Uh, I mean left to curiosity or I mean, creativity of, 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 uh, of a person to construct a machine which recognizes uh, that language. No, it's, it's not like that. So there are certain criteria uh, which we can use to test whether a language is, is regular or not. Even without constructing a finite automata, we can test that whether it will be, able, it, it, it will be possible to construct a finite automata or not, right? And we will learn it toward the end of next week or maybe uh, next to next week that, what is that situation, okay? So there is a way, there is a way, and we will, we will come, come back to that. <clears throat> so regular languages, the easiest languages or the basic languages, and since these languages are connected with the most basic computational model, so it means that in order to construct, in order to construct, recognize a finite, uh, in, in order to recognize a regular language, we do not need a lot of computational resources because the underlying computational questions of those languages are very simple, right? They, they do not require, uh, you, uh, require use of, uh, I mean, enormous amount of memory 
or an enormous amount of computational resources and so on and so forth. So it, they are easy in that sense, right? Uh, anyway, so a regular language is a very simple language. So now let me um, introduce some operations that we can apply on regular language. We say that let A and B be languages. Okay. So not just languages, they are regular languages. So let A and B be two regular languages. Then we define regular operations. So we define regular, they are called regular operations because they are related with the regular languages. So what are those operations? So we define three kinds of operation. The first one is the union operation. The second one is the concatenation operation. Okay, and the third one is the star operation. And I will define what all these operations mean, right? So A is a language, B is a language. So the union is definitely A union B, right? Since A is a language, B is a language. So A is a set of strings, B is a set of strings. So the union of A and B must be the union of two sets. That's very simple, right? Now you can think about this A as a finite, let's say for, for the sake of simplicity, um, uh, you can take A, Let's say alphabet is fixed with zero and one. And let's say A contains all the strings of zeros, no one, right? And B contains all the strings of ones, no, no zeros. Then union of the union of A and B would be all strings of zeros, either zeros or ones, right? So this is very simple. Concatenation, what is concatenation? So concatenation, we already have seen concatenation of two uh, strings, but we have not seen concatenation of two uh, languages. Suppose A is the language, so the concatenation operator is like small circle over here. Uh, so we, we define it, we define it as a set because it's a language, so it must be a set. So this set consists of all those strings X and Y such that X comes from the first language A and Y comes from the second language. Okay, so let me give you an example. So it will be easier. So I will go to the next page. I will consider sigma to be zero and one. Suppose A consists of some strings of just zeros. Zero, 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 zero. zero, zero. Okay, they are very simple languages. One, 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 and one, one, one. Okay, these are just very simple language. What is A union B? Let's call it C. So it would be zero, 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 one, 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 and one, one, five. So this is a new language, contains strings from both the languages, right? What is A in concatenation B? Let's call it D. What it would be? It would be a set of strings such that each string will have two parts. The first part will come from set A, and the second part will come from set B. So zero will be combined with all these three strings. So we have zero one, we have zero one one, zero one one one. Okay, then we will have zero zero. So we have zero zero one, zero zero one one, zero zero one one one. Then we would have zero zero zero. One zero 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 one one and zero 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 one one one. Okay, so this would be the concatenation of two languages, right? So you can imagine that if you have a language A and if, if you have a language B, then the union of two languages would have more elements than individual, right? And similarly, if you have a language A and language B, then the concatenation will definitely have many more, uh, many more uh, strings. Yes, you can say that. So, so, so prefixes will come from language A and uh, suffixes will come from the uh, language B. Okay, is this thing clear? Now we have a third operation which we call star operation. In star operation, so both these operations are binary operations. That is, they require two languages, but this one is a unary operator. 
it only requires one operator at home, right? So what is the star operator? Let's say we have a language A, then we put a star on it, <clears throat> okay? And I will define that what is the star, okay? And I would first give you the definition of A star without any uh, uh, example, and then I will give you an example. So we say that A star is a set that contains X1, X2, Xk, such that K is greater than or equal to zero. And each Xi belongs to A. So let's take an example of a very simple language. So let's not consider the same language A, let's consider a different language A. And this time our language contains zero and one, just two strings, a string zero and a string one. So what will be A star in this particular case? A star will contain an empty because it says K is greater than or equal to zero. So K is greater than or equal to zero means that K could be zero. So when K is zero, it means that there is no symbol in it, so empty string or the uh, epsilon is there. Empty string is there, right? Sorry. So according to the definition, we can take any string from this set A and concatenate it with any other string as many times as possible. So we can take zero and concatenate it, just take zero. So this zero is there and one is there, then we can concatenate zero twice. We can concatenate zero twice. We can concatenate zero four times and so on. Similarly, we can concatenate, concatenate one twice or thrice or four times or five times and so on. Or we can concatenate zero with one or one with zero or zero zero with one or one zero with zero or one one with zero and so on, right? So this is even with, with very small language that contains just two elements, A star contains infinitely many elements, right? So A star is a language which contains, which definitely contains a lot more. It is, it is not Cartesian product. It's, it's not Cartesian because in Cartesian product, there is an order over here when you put a star, uh, since uh, we put a star on a set and there is no order inside a set, so there is no order. It's not Cartesian product. And Cartesian product only works uh, in, in just one application, right? And over here, we can apply it as many times as possible. We just have a lower bound, which is K is zero, uh, but the upper bound is undefined, right? It can be zero, it could be one, two, three, four, five, ten, million, trillion, million, trillion, 100 trillion, or any number. As long as this K is, is a natural number, that's perfectly fine. And you know that natural numbers have, uh, they do not have any upper bound, right? So there is no upper bound. So even with a very small, simple language that contains two string, we get an infinite supply of strings. And not only that, in fact, we can even construct a simpler language. Let's say B contains just one. It's a language which contains just one string and that string is, is one. So what will be B star? Empty string will be there. One will be there, one, one will be there, one, one, one will be there, one, 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 one will be there, and so on. Right? All possible strings of one of any size, including zero and one till any natural number. So there are infinitely many strings over here. Even with a very simple and a small language that contains just one string of length, one. Okay? Now suppose there is a language C that contains a string zero, one. Okay, zero one. What would be C star? Can anyone tell me? Um, the empty string, uh, the string empty zero string. one itself, um, zero one zero one, and zero one zero one zero one as many times as you want. Yes, so you can have uh, as many copies of zero one as you like. One, I mean, you can have zero copies or one copy two copies or three copies or four or five or 10, any number of copies, right? So there are infinitely many strings, but you cannot just have ones or zeros. 
all these copies must be zero one. So you can have any number of copies of zero one. Okay. Okay, so let me write a theorem over here, the first result of our class. We will try to prove it. Uh, in uh, the theorem says that class of regular languages is closed under the union operator and two, the concatenation operator. And we will later on put a third one as well. So let me write it in blue because we will not include it here, uh, the star operator. I will explain what does, what does this theorem say and what is the possible proof of this theorem. So I think we can take a break of five minutes or maybe 10 minutes. So right now it is 7.26. So is it okay if we come back at 7.35? Okay, sir. Okay, so we will all come back at 7.35, yes. So there are some questions in the chat. Uh, what's the question is that, is this set a finite set? Which set you are talking about? Which question, uh, which which set you are talking about? No, A star is not, a, is A star is never a finite set. A star cannot be finite because uh, they are infinitely, there are always infinitely many friends. Okay, so there's a request that we can make it 15 minutes. Okay, so let's make it 15 minutes. Let's come back. Let's, let us come back at 7.45. It's, it's more than 15. Okay. So I think that should be enough. Uh, so I will stop here. And, uh, and uh, if you want to leave right now, you can. Otherwise, I will stay here for a couple more minutes if you have any questions. Uh, just questions. We will not discuss anything else. And then at 7.30, I will stop recording and uh, we can all go for a break and come back in 15 minutes. Okay. If no questions, then I will stop recording. Sir, can you, uh, can you explain what does closed under mean? Yes, I, I will explain it after we come back from the, from the, uh, from the place. Because everyone has to know it, right? So it's a good question that if it is infinite, then how it will be regular. So we already have considered an infinite regular language. Um, and I will give you, we already have done it. So uh, when you will come back from the, from the break, I will tell you that it doesn't mean uh, that if, if a language is infinite, it cannot be regular. Like right? languages can be infinite. That's not the problem. Only the machine has to be finite in order to accept it. And we already have seen very simple finite machines one containing three states, one containing two states, already accepting infinite languages, right? So we can accept infinite languages with a finite machine, right? So you can write a very small program with two lines, maybe in any programming language, maybe in Java or Python, which runs forever, right? Two is a finite number, uh, but it will run forever, right? So for example, in Python, you can write uh, while, True, okay, and it will run forever, right? It's a finite program, runs infinitely. Anyway, uh, so I will stop recording and we can come back at 7.45, short. Uh, so I will stop sharing.
<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope all Hello, of you are sir. back. Hello. Are you all back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So let's start. <clears throat> so uh, I, I just wrote the first result, first theorem of this course. And this theorem says that the class of regular languages is closed under. Uh, the three operation that we just learned, the union operation, uh, the concatenation operator operation, and, and the star operation. <clears throat> okay, uh, so this, uh, so, so in order to prove it, or in order to understand the mechanism behind it, we need to understand the statement first. So the statement has three things, which are the three operations, the union, concatenation, and the star, which I, I just defined before the, uh, before the start of the break. Uh, but we need to know what is meant by a closed under, right? Um, so I will just quickly define what is closed under, what does it mean? And then we will come back to this theorem and try to understand what this, uh, what does this theorem say? So closed under means it has a very specific meaning in mathematics. <clears throat> uh, for example, you consider the set of natural numbers. And uh, we will use this, this example or similar examples where we use set of natural numbers very often in this course and other courses, as this is one of my favorite sets. Uh, so set of natural numbers is zero, one, two, three, and so on, right? All non-negative integers are there, right? And some, some authors do not include zero, some authors include zero, but it doesn't matter. So this, this is the set of natural numbers. Now, if I say that I take, an an element A from the set of natural numbers. I don't tell you what is this element, but there is an element A. So if this element is, is, is from the set of natural numbers N, then it could be zero or one or two or three or five or 500 or 1000. It could be any number, right? Similarly, B is a number that is also from this, set, right? So these are two elements, two numbers, which are uh, chosen from the same set. And that set in this example is set of natural numbers. Now, if I say that if I have this number A and a number B and I add these two numbers, whatever result that I would receive, let's call it C, I claim that the C also belongs to the set of natural numbers. Right? So we say that set of natural numbers. is closed under the operation of addition. Okay. Is this set closed under the operation of subtraction? No, it, this set is not closed under this operation of addition. For example, if I say that uh, take A as three and B as five, then three minus five is minus two, which is not in this at n. Therefore, this set is not close in the subtraction. Similarly, this set is um, closed under multiplication because if you take any two numbers from the set and you multiply them, the result is again in, in this set. So zero times anything is zero and zero is here. One times anything that any number is that number. So that number is already there. And if you pick any two numbers, any two positive uh, non-negative integers, uh, then the product of those two uh, non-negative integers would be another non-negative integer. And that number must be in the set because this is infinitely long set, right? So this set is closed under the operation of addition. This set is of, uh, closed under the operation of multiplication, but this set is not closed under the operation of subtraction. And similarly, the set is not closed under the operation of, of division because if you, if you divide two numbers, then it is not necessary that the resulting number is a natural number, right? Two divided by one is two, which is already in, in the set, but one divided by two, which is half, is not in the set, right? So, so this set is closed under certain operations. This set is not closed under certain operations, right? So we say that whenever we have a set which is closed under certain operation, it means that if you take, uh, so let's say that operation is, is binary operation. So it means that if you take two elements from that set and you apply that operation, then the resulting set is again in the same set. This is called close under, the definition of close under. Now let's go back to the, to the theorem. 
It says a class of regular languages. So what does it mean by class of regular languages? It means all possible regular languages, right? So a regular language, a small regular language, or a big regular language, or any regular language that you can think of, all those languages which exist, and all those languages which are in this set, which I explain here, which I try to explain here in this small part here. For, for all those languages for which we can construct finite automata. So this is called the class of language. A class is, is nothing but a fancier name uh, for a set, right? So class of language means, class of language means a set, a, a big set, a mega set or whatever you want to call it. So a class of regular languages means that class of, or the set of all possible regular languages. So since a language is a set, so this is a set of sets, right? So it's, it's a big set that contains other big sets. So it, it's really a big set, right? So it says that that big set of regular languages is closed under the operation of uh, union, the operation of concatenation. That is, if you take any two regular languages and you do the union, the resulting language is again a regular language. If you take any two regular languages and concatenate them, then the resulting language is regular. Okay, And it also has a third part, which we will cover in a later theorem, uh, which says that if you take a regular language and you apply star operation, then the resulting language is again a regular language. <clears throat> So this is the essence of this theorem. And the proof is very simple. And uh, I will not cover the proof right now because it requires some tools which we haven't covered, or which we haven't uh, discussed. So once we cover those tools, the proof will become very simple and clear that how it is possible that two, a union of two regular languages is always regular or concatenation of two regular languages is always regular. And also the star of a regular language is regular. <clears throat> okay. So the question comes here. Do you understand this theorem now? Do you understand the meaning of this theorem? Do you understand each and every keyword in this theorem? Any question about this theorem? Okay, great. And there was a question before we went to the break uh, that was about the infinite languages. So there was a misconception uh, that maybe regular languages are only finite languages. No, a, a regular language doesn't have to be finite. It can be infinite because, um, so just consider the set of all strings which end with C. Okay, so let's, let's say that we fix an alphabet and this alphabet is zero one. So we fix an alphabet and this alphabet is zero one. Okay, and I say that consider a set A, that contains all strings over sigma such that every string ends in zero, okay? How many strings would be in A? Finite? Definitely not finite. Infinitely many strings, right? because we have the string zero, we have the string zero, zero, we have string zero, 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 and all strings which end with zero. So one zero is there, one, one zero is there, one zero, one zero is there, and so on. So all the strings of length one, strings of length two, strings of length three, strings of length four, and there are many, many different strings of length, any length, right? Uh, the only requirement is that all such a string must end in zero. And we know that all those strings which end in zero are basically the, the binary representation of even numbers, right? So this set A contains all such binary strings which represent even numbers. So there are infinitely many even numbers. So it means that this language is definitely an infinite language, right? Uh, but this language is regular because we just have constructed a finite automaton which, which recognizes or accepts this language. Accepting means that which which accepts each and every string from this language. So whenever you pick a string from this language and you, you provide it as an input to the, that finite automaton, it will always end in an acceptance state, right? Or recognizing means that, that that's exactly the same thing. We say that it, it, it will accept each and every string in this language, right? So it, it, the question is not the time. It's not about the time that how much time it will take to accept each and every string. The question is that whenever you send any string over there, it will 
accept. For example, if, if I if I give you a calculator, a physical calculator that can only do multiplication, addition, subtraction, division, uh, and deal with, for example, uh, numbers and uh, right, so some numbers and decimal, uh, decimal, some decimal numbers. Maybe it also handles fractions and things like that. So, uh, so the manufacturer of the calculator has not tried addition, subtraction, multiplication, division of all possible numbers that this calculator can 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 do. But it is guaranteed that whenever you provide numbers which are within the capacity or the finite capacity or finite memory of the calculator, if you provide two such numbers, it will be able to give you an answer, a proper answer, right? That, that's exactly the, the thing over here. Even though it contains infinite strings, we are not going to accept all those strings at, at once, but whenever we, click, uh, whenever we pick one string from, from the set A, our machine will be capable to, to accept that string. This is what it means by accepting or recognizing. So a, a regular language doesn't have to be finite. It can be infinite. Uh, and we will prove later on that every finite language is basically regular, uh, but not all regular languages are finite. Okay, all finite languages are regular. Uh, this is not a theorem here. I usually give this theorem as one of the quiz or exam questions. So it's, it's already out now. Every finite language is regular. Uh, but not all regular languages are finite. Is this thing clear? Any question? No questions? Okay. So we will stop here and we will introduce one important con concept. It may, actually the thing is that since it is a summer course, so it may, uh, I mean, feel like we are uh, pacing. It's too fast. Uh, but the thing is that we, since it's a summer course, we need to cover everything. So we have to be a little bit faster. So I define a concept called non-determinant. Okay. Versus determinism. Okay. So, so the finite automata FA that we have been working with or for which we have seen the definition we put a D before that, okay? So we get put the prefix. This D FA means deterministic finite automata. So whatever automata definition and, and examples we have seen, they're all deterministic. Now we have to introduce a new concept called non-deterministic automata, and we would use FA but we would put N before it, right? Some authors put N uh, DFA, but that's just that not correct. So NFA means non-deterministic finite automata, okay? So what is meant by non-determinism? Before I start explaining, can anyone tell me uh, what do you think about non-determinism? Yes, anyone? Can anyone try? Um, sir, uh, in non-deterministic, we are not sure about the or the about the next state, or there are multiple possible uh, states from one state. Yeah, that's true. So non-determinism comes from um, the concept that that it is not predestined. I mean. It has deeper philosophical meanings and, and it has deeper computational meaning, but in the context of finite automata, non-determinism has a very specific meaning. Okay, and I will explain that what that specific meaning is. So we will study non-deterministic finite automata. So non-determinism non is a very useful concept in, in, in automata. So for example, if you construct a machine, uh, a simple machine, a simple DFA or simple deterministic finite automata, uh, so, I mean, the couple of examples that we have already seen, they're all deterministic finite automata. So in a deterministic finite automata or simply a finite automata, uh, every step of computation follows in a very predictable manner, right? So we already know that if the machine is in one state and it reads one particular symbol, then it knows which state to go. It knows that whether to stay in that same state or to go to a new state, right? So there's 
there is one particular transition. So the transition function is very predictable, right? While in non-deterministic finite automaton, we have some flexibility. So non-deterministic finite automata can be in multiple states at the same time. It doesn't have to be in one of the states. It can be in multiple states. So there is a similarity of, of non-deterministic uh, non-determinism in finite automata with um, with the uh, non-determinism of, for example, nature of light. So we know that the light behaves as as particles. Also, it behaves as as a wave, right? So it's it's a it's a dual nature. So sometimes it it behaves like waves. Sometimes it behaves like particles, and sometimes it behaves like both. And and we do not know how it will behave in a certain situation. Right, so it's it's very similar over here. Then non-deterministic non-deterministic finite automaton. Uh, the transition function tells us that that the machine can be in one or multiple states at the same time. Even after reading one particular symbol in a particular state, the machine may decide to stay in that state, or to move to another state, or move to third state or fourth state. So yeah. these multiple states are possible in the non-deterministic finite automaton. Uh, so any machine uh, that uses non-determinism uh, leads to a concept of non-deterministic machine. And the simplest machine we discussed is the finite automaton. So we have the equivalent or we have the non-deterministic version of the finite automaton, which we will discuss now, okay? So let me give you a very simple example and it will become clear that what we are trying to say, okay? So let me... Let me construct or draw an automaton. So I have one state here. So let uh, I'm not uh, uh, I'm not. No, it's, it's okay if I put the labels. Let's say it's just Q1. So Q1 is the starting state, and machine says that if it reads zero, it stays in Q1. If it reads one, it stays in Q1. Okay, and there is a transition from here. It says that the machine goes to state Q2. If it reads one, right? So you can see that there's always this confusion. So when the machine reads one, does it stay in Q1 or go to Q2? And that's exactly what I meant by multiple states. So when the machine is in Q1 and it reads one, it can be in both the states at the same time simultaneously, right? So it can be in Q1 and it can be in Q2. It's, it's like quantum states of superposition, very similar, but a little bit different. So it can be in both the states at the same time. Similarly in Q2, it can decide to read zero and go to Q3. Okay. In Q3, it can decide by reading one to go to Q4. And in Q4, it can decide to read zero and one and stay here. Right? Is this thing clear? So when it reads zero, it, 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 it goes to Q3. But it's, it's not enough. I, I can introduce one more thing, which is called epsilon, which is called empty transitions. So when the machine is in Q2, it can decide to go to Q3 without reading anything. And this is what this empty transition means. Right? So empty transition means that when the machine is in Q2, it can be in Q3 because there is an empty transition between Q2 and Q3. Okay? So it's not just non-deterministic in a sense that it can be in multiple state by reading one symbol. It can be in multiple state, but it can be in multiple state even without reading it. Okay? So this is the complete uh, picture of a non-deterministic finite automata. So this is non-deterministic finite automata. And if you contrast it with a DFA or deterministic finite automaton, in a deterministic automaton, you have a transition function, which has to be a total function. Okay, for DFA, this transition function delta has to be a total function. But for NFA, this transition function the delta doesn't have to be a total function. It can be a partial. Sir, uh, what do you mean by a total function? Okay, uh, when, uh, okay, so so as I mentioned, the, this course uses a lot of references to discrete mathematics. Uh, when was the last time you studied discrete mathematics? Almost when, a year. 
almost a year okay and that's okay uh, i just wanted to know that maybe you covered uh, the concept of total functions partial functions in this kind of mathematics did you cover this concept i guess yes okay so let me give a refresher so do you know what is a function yes sir does everyone know what is a function You must have studied yes, in calculus and in discrete mathematics and maybe other. Yes, sir. A function is basically a mapping, right? Is a mapping between two sets. So let's say f is a function. It's a mapping between two sets A and B. So we say that f maps elements of set A to the elements of set B. So we say that A is the domain. Of f, right? And we say that B is the codomain. Okay. So, so when we say that f is a function, we say that for for each value of in A, f of A must be defined. If it is not defined, then it is not a function. For example, if I say that f is a function. That maps, let's say, real numbers to real numbers, and I say that f is defined as f of x is equal to one over x. Is this a function? Yes. Yes. No. Anyone who says no. But most of you say yes. But is there anyone who says no? So the real answer is no. It's not yes. It's not a function. Yeah, you can say no after after I say no. Yeah. So this is not a function. Why is it not a function? Because it does not fit this definition of for all a in a f of a must be defined. Because zero belongs to a set of real numbers, and f of zero in this particular case is under. Oh yeah. I... Right. So this is not a function. In order to make it a function, we need to redefine it. We say that f is a set of is a function from set of real numbers without zero to set of real numbers now this is a function function okay so this is a function so a, a function is called so when we say a function so we mean that every function is a total function so whenever it is defined for each and every element in the domain then it is called a total function or simply a function because by by saying that a function something is a function we mean that it's a total function uh, but if a function is if if a mapping is not defined uh, for certain elements of the domain maybe one element or two elements or five elements or maybe many elements uh, then we say that this is not a function rather a partial function because whatever whatever that is defined it is defined but there are certain things in the domain for which it is not defined right so when i say that the transition function has to be total function in the dfa it means that it must be defined for each and every possible pair of uh, state in the input symbol right so every input symbol must go out every every state in the finite automaton must have an arrow outgoing which has a label for all possible uh, elements of the alphabet right so for example if the alphabet is 0 and 1 then for every state there must be an arrow that goes out with label 0 and label 1 right otherwise it means that that, that state is not defined for particular input while in nfa it doesn't have to be a true function it can be a partial function for example q2 is not defined for for 1 what happens when the machine reads 1 when it is in q2 it is not defined it is this behavior is not defined for q2 right that's why it is in nfa and nfa means that it is It, the transition function is partial not total similarly when the machine is in q3 it is undefined what happens when it reads zero okay uh what do you mean by dumping i did not get your question what is uh where is the trash state we haven't talked about trash state 
we've done DFA only, and uh, as far as I remember, we have to address all possible states. So if there is, I, I think it was in DFA or I think it is in NFA. I don't remember which one, which is why I asked. So we will we will come back, come to it, uh, come to it when it is required. So a DFA has to have all possible outgoing ed ed edges from each and every state. And if for some reason we cannot define, then we create a new state uh, where all such transition leap. Because the requirement that is that this del delta must be totally constant, right? So in, in certain cases, if we cannot define, then we create a, a trash state or dumping state or error state. Uh, so you, you can name it anything, anywhere. Uh, so when we will do some examples, which would require such a state, we will be it. But in all such cases, we can always come up with, with the situation where it is not required. We can, we, can, uh, we can make our way without using such. Okay, is this in clear? Any question? Okay, no question. So let's move on and let's define what is an NFA formally. So an NFA is also a five triple, right? So it is Q, sigma, delta, Q0, NF. It is exactly, the, it, it is defined exactly the way it is defined for, for the DFA, except the meaning of these things look different, right? So Q is the finite set of state. Okay. And sigma is the alphabet. Finite set of alphabet. So finite is important for both Q and sigma. Okay. And delta is a function. Okay. A partial function which acts on a certain state of the uh, automaton. And one symbol from the alphabet, including empty circuit. Right. So some, some authors write it this way. Uh, some authors write it the other way. I will give you the alternate definition. And the resulting state is a power set. Okay, so this is the power set. Power set means that all possible subsets. Okay, so the alternate definition is that delta, Q, sigma, union, epsilon, power set. Okay. So you can write it this way, this way, or this way doesn't matter. Uh, the rest of the things are very similar. So this is start state. And F is a subset of Q, or set of uh, accepting states. Or, fin or, or final states. Okay. And clear? So it's so, an yeah. NFA, only the transition function is different from the DFA, right? Yeah, so the different although everything the difference is, is yeah, everything else is same. The difference is in the transition function. Everything else is same. So let's let's uh, let me draw the same uh, automaton here and uh, we will talk about everything in form formal formality. So Q1 when it reads 0, 1. It stays in Q1. When it reads one, it goes to Q2. Uh, when it reads zero, or it can take an empty transition to go to Q3. In Q3, it can read one, go to Q4. Q4 is the accepting state. And in Q4, it, it reads zero and one and stays there. Okay. So what is Q here? Q is Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4, right? Sigma is just zero and one. There are two symbols. What is transition function? Delta here. So we can define, sorry. We can define the transition function delta using a table. And how many states we have? Here we have four states. Let's have Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Okay. Now, since it's an, it's an NFA, so every state can transition from one or from, from zero or one, or it can also transition from empty. So we have three possibilities, zero, one, and epsilon, right? So what happens when the machine is in Q1 and reads zero? 
It only okay, goes to Q1. Q1. Right? So uh, let me write it in, in a set position. When the machine is in Q1 and reads one, where does it go? Q1 and Q2. It can go to Q1 and Q2. When the machine is in Q1, where does it go if it reads nothing? It doesn't go anywhere, right? So it's an empty set. Since we are using sets, so this is an empty set. So what happens when the machine is Q2 and reads zero? It goes to Q3. Q3. When the machine is in Q2 and reads one, where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere because it is empty. And what happens when it reads nothing? It can go to Q3, right? When in Q3, it is empty set here because it is undefined for the, for the zero. But it is defined for one and it goes to Q4. And it is undefined here because it doesn't take any empty transitions. When in Q4, when it reads zero, it stays in Q4. When it reads one, it stays in Q4. When it reads nothing, it's undefined and is. This is the uh, transition table. So this is the transition table. Or you can define the function transition function using, right? Uh, similarly, Q1 is the starting state. Or initial state. And what is F? F in this particular case is just Q4. So for this machine, this is the formal uh, description or uh, or explanation of, of this machine. Sir, in DFA, do we have empty transitions? No, in, an, in DFA, we do not have empty transitions. We only have uh, non-empty transitions. Okay. Uh, can NFA have multiple accepting states? Of course, any any DFA, any NFA can have any number of accepting states. Uh, in these particular examples which we have covered so far, there is only one accepting state, but this is not required, right? Every DFA and every NFA can have one or two or multiple accepting states. Okay. And in NFA, we will see that it is really not necessary to have multiple accepting state because in an NFA, we can always take an empty transition, right? So rather than creating a Q4 um, or maybe Q3 in accepting state, we can create a, another Q5 and take an empty transition from these two states to Q5, which is in accepting state. So don't worry, we will cover it, don't worry. So it, of course it can have multiple accepting states. Both DFA and NFA can have uh, multiple accepting states. Is this is clear? Yeah, I, I was asking in DFA, um, we must have one transition for each member of the alphabet, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Now, once we have a machine, once we have a machine, we define the language, right? And this is how we define the language of a DFA. And that language was NFA. Uh, that language was, sorry, regular. So we can also define the language of NFA. And surprisingly, the language of NFA is again regular. And we will have a theorem later on, which says that uh, <clears throat> uh, the theorem uh, later on says that it does not matter how you uh, construct your machine, whether a DFA or NFA, you can, whatever language that you accept or recognize, uh, they are regular. So it means that every non-deterministic finite automaton has an equivalent deterministic finite automaton. Yes, there is some question. So can we have um, both an NFA and a DFA for the same language? Yes, that's exactly what I said. So, it, so the theorem that we will uh, describe, so this is a theorem number two, uh, which we will prove in detail, not today, um, probably next week or maybe later. Let me write the theorem. It says that every non-deterministic Finite automaton has an equivalent to 
So the statement says that whenever you construct a non-deterministic finite automaton, you can have an equivalent deterministic finite automaton, right? That is the language that is recognized by a non-deterministic finite automaton can be recognized by a deterministic finite automaton. And we already know that the, the finite automaton recognizes regular languages. Therefore, non-deterministic finite automaton also recognize regular language. And later on, we will see that this, this conversion is it's not just one way, it is two ways. So every deterministic finite automaton has an equivalent uh, deterministic finite automaton. So when we say every, it means that there is no deterministic finite automaton uh, for which we do not have deterministic finite automaton. Yes, Amar, you have any question? So, sir, it's like possible uh, to convert an NFA to DSA and uh, it's not possible? Yes. Whenever we have an NFA, we will convert, we can convert it into a DSA. And in fact, that will be part of a couple more theorems that we will see. And it, one of the theorem is called the clean theorem. So, the star operation that I defined, uh, this is called clean star operation or cleans operation this way. Clean was a mathematician who worked on these things. Therefore it is named after him. So, so we have a Clean's theorem as well. The Clean's theorem tells us that, that every, uh, so whenever you have a regular language, you can convert, you can construct a non-deterministic uh, finite automaton. And whenever you have a non whenever you have a, uh, an automaton, regardless whether finite or regardless whether deterministic or non-deterministic, uh, you can con convert it into a regular language, right? So it's a constructible theorem. It's not just a statement which talks about some properties. It actually gives you an algorithm which you can use to construct a machine. And we will use that. So I think that's all for today. Uh, we, we are past or almost past the time. Uh, I will stop here and there's a couple more minutes. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. You might have some questions. Um, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, what is the point of having a non-deterministic automaton if, if we can con construct any other uh, equivalent deterministic finite automaton? What's the, what's the point of having an NFA then? That's an excellent question, actually. And uh, so this is something that we know now, right? So when mathematicians started working on these models, they did not know that whether, they did not know that the non-deterministic automaton uh, will not be more powerful because they thought that we might be adding some power to to the machine. And they thought that maybe this machine, non-deterministic machine will be capable of doing something more than what DFAs could do. Uh, but eventually we found out that non-deterministic automata NFA is equal to DFA and, and, and vice versa. So it doesn't add any power. Uh, but the concept of non-determinism itself is so interesting and so important that for this simple model of computation, it doesn't add any power. Even though it doesn't add any power, it adds some features and properties uh, which are present in non-deterministic automaton, which are not present in deterministic automaton. And that is from the point of view of time complexity. So the second part of the course. So for example, if I give you an, an NFA, very simple, small NFA, in order to convert, so we know that it can be converted into, into a DFA, but once you convert that into a, into a DFA, so the, so the size of the DFA can explode. It can exponentially grow from the starting size of the NFA. So maybe you have N states, the number of states is N in NFA, but once you convert it into deterministic finite automata, it can have number of states exponentially more than the NFA. So even though they compute exactly the same language, uh, the time complexity could be a little bit different. So it is, it is important from that point of view. And when we will discuss more complicated computational models, we will see that this is not the case with all other comp computation models. Some computation models actually add more power by non determinism in some cases, it doesn't add much power, but in some cases, it adds power. So with non-determinism, you are able to uh, accept and recognize more languages than what you can do with the deterministic version. In some cases, it does not add power, but in any case, the time complexity is important aspect. 
I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, next class would be on campus, most probably on campus. Uh, un, 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 other, I mean, unless there is some some exceptional circumstances, so I will let you know in 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 time. Uh, so by Monday or afternoon or by Tuesday morning, I will let you know that whether I will be taking class from campus or not. Okay. Um, what info you require on LeTech? Yes, it's it's going to be hybrid. So we will. I will be teaching like this, and uh, I will try to point my camera towards the board uh, whenever I need to write. Uh, right. So I will make sure that we are all able to see. Uh, no, I haven't yet decided what would be the mode of quizzes and exam. Um, it depends uh, what is the mode of teaching, and with that we will decide it. Uh, so so let let's let's wait till next week next week on Tuesday. And I, I will let you know by Tuesday that what is the moment. Uh, regarding LaTeX, so I already have conducted some workshop a long time ago uh, on LaTeX. So I have all the presentations and, and, and slides. So maybe I will uh, upload those slides on uh, LMS. So you can download. I will also uh, up upload some links to the documents and all the resources that you can use for LaTeX. And you can get a quick head start here. Okay. Okay. Any other question? So I will upload the lecture and everything by tonight or by tomorrow morning at most. Okay. okay. In that case, thank you very much. I'll see you on Tuesday. And good luck. Take care of yourself. Be positive. Be safe. And I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you very much for, for your time. Take care. Bye bye for the office.